So it's Palm Sunday, and the number of, there's so many things that occur, the length of the Passion narrative and so on, we could never go through all of it, but I'd like to raise a few points that come up in the, well, in, in, in the overall liturgy as well as the, the reading of the Passion. Um, first of all, I think it's an interesting Sunday in that it's kind of schizophrenic, isn't it? I mean, we start out waving palms and shouting Hosanna to the Son of David, and then by 20 minutes, within 20 minutes, we're shouting crucify him. And, um, wow, but you see, this is how we are. And, you know, we, I think we just have to accept that this is kind of a picture of how we can be. We, from the same mouth, can come praise, and 10 minutes later, 20 minutes later, cursing. You know, it, it is just how we are. We're very, you know, we're, we're very duplicitous in some ways, and we struggle. And um, so before we just say, well, this is kind of a crazy Sunday, we need to figure out what it's really all about. It is about, it's about us. It's about what the Lord does, and it's also about us. Now, I think that an, an image, therefore, to take away from the Palm Sundays, we do take the palms home. And as you hold the palms in your hand, there might be something um, to, to ponder, that that's your better self when you shout Hosanna to the Son of David, when you welcome Christ and you're joyful in his presence. That's the better you, the better me. And so it's common that we take this palm home and some people like to braid it up and do things, but at the end of the day, we, a lot of us just tuck it behind the, cr the main cross in the house. And as I still have my palm from last year. <laughs> I'll sup replace it tomorrow uh, on Palm Sunday. I'm recording this on Saturday. But I think that um, it, it, I look to it and I say, well, I, that's who I hope to be. The one who shouts Hosanna and welcomes Christ, not the one who shouts crucify and is either offended by him or, or afraid of him. That's not, I, I, want, I, I want to welcome Christ. That's my better self. So that's, I think, one theme that we see that's worth mentioning. Um, and which, which are you? Which am I? Hmm? And that palm is meant to remind you. Now, another theme that's interesting is there comes a moment in the Passion that's dripping with irony where Pilate says, I'll tell you what, I got Barabbas or I got Jesus. Who do you want me to release? And um, <clears throat> Now, it's interesting that the name Barabbas means son of the father. Um, the um, is, uh, Eusebius, the church historian, says that Barabbas' first name was Jesus. <laughs> now, that's not, you know, not that unlikely uh, because Jesus was a common name. Yeshua, Joshua, Jesus, you know. These were common names at the time, uh, like we have common names in our culture. So it's not like, wow, this is astonishing. You know, it's, it's not, it could just be a coincidence, but it's interesting, isn't it, that Jesus Barabbas, in other words, Jesus, son of the father, is standing next to the true Jesus, son of the true father, the true son of the father. <laughs> and so in a way, Barabbas represents a fraudulent, fake understanding of Jesus, our Messiah and Lord. And Jesus, of course, is the real deal. And the crowd says, well, we want Barabbas. Now, Barabbas was an insurrectionist. He was a revolutionary. Uh, some texts say he was a robber. Probably that too. Uh, but but again, the the main thing is that he would have exhibited a kind of um, a messianism. Although he never, we don't claim that he's he ever claimed to be the Messiah, any kind of a Messiah. But it, it was a common theme that the true Messiah, when he came, would be an insurrectionist, would be a, a revolutionary who would go up against the Romans and destroy their power, reestablish the kingdom of David, and, and restore economic prosperity and political power uh, to Israel as a nation. All right. That, of course, Jesus recoiled at that, and he said, if that's the case, don't even call me the Messiah. Uh, but he, he rather followed more from the suffering servant songs about uh, through his wounds, uh, he will heal many. By his stripes, we are healed. Now, um, there's two Jesus Barabbases standing before them, and they choose the fake, the fake one, the one who represents their worldly points of view. Okay. Now, this, of course, is a temptation for us. There's a lot of people who want to rework Christ. They don't want the Christ of the Bible. 
The real Christ, if you really sit down and carefully read Jesus, a lot of the things he says and does are quite shocking. He doesn't compromise. He doesn't want anyone to compromise when it comes to being his disciple. And he says, if you're not going to do, like, take up your cross and follow me, if you aren't willing to leave everything and love me above all things, even your very life, you can't be my disciple. I mean, this is the real Jesus who says sometimes shocking things. And a lot of people don't like that. So they water him down, kind of turn him into a harmless hippie. I would argue a fake Jesus, not the real Jesus of Scripture, but a kind of a Jesus of their own making or understanding. That's kind of like Jesus Barabbas or Jesus the Christ, this, the true son of the Father. Who do you want? Do you want the real one or do you want the fake one? Well, I got news for you. The fake one can't save you. But again, many people still prefer a fake or a watered down, kind of a reworked Jesus. No can do. Can't, you got, you got to have the real one. Only the real one can save you. So those are a couple of kind of overarching themes. <clears throat> we have choices to make. Uh, is it Hosanna or crucify? Is it Jesus Barabbas or Jesus, uh, the true son of the Father, uh, the Christ? Who do you want? You know, make your choice. Okay, so when we come also to the Passion, we sort of see a pretty poor portrait of the apostles, very uninspiring. <laughs> And uh, it's, uh, it's kind of scandalous. You know, only John makes it to the foot of the cross. All of the rest of them bug out. And they engage in a series of behaviors that are, you know, um, problematic to say the least. And we can laugh at them or we can say, oh, shake our head and say, ain't it awful? Or we can also say that, well, we do things like this, the things that I'll describe to you. We, these are things we do as well. And we can say, wow, you know. One of the most common themes in the New Testament is the inept response when it comes to the apostles. Jesus gives some teaching, and they immediately show they don't get it. Within a verse or two, they're already breaking the very thing he taught them not you know, to do. You know, and, and so you get the point. And we have a kind of a laugh, but we're that way. And we do these things I'm about to describe to you. And they, why do they do them, and why do we do them? Well, we'll get to that. But let's just list a few of them. We're not going to cover all of it. But the first thing you notice is that in the garden, they've been at the Last Supper, and they come to the garden. Only Peter, James, and John, the rest of them were kind of back in a cave. If you go to Israel today, to Jerusalem, there's a kind of a, a series of caves at the base of the Mount of Olives that's likely a place where Jesus would have um, stayed. But he went out into the garden area and took with him Peter, James, and John while the rest of the apostles probably stayed back in the cave. Why stay in a cave? Well, it was, it was a shelter. You know, we think of caves as like, oh my gosh, bats and, you know, crazy dark stuff. But for them, uh, these were often shelters and places to stay. It, it tended to be cool at night, uh, especially in the, in the April time frame. It uh, can get very warm during the day, but it can also get very chilly at night. So it's a good place, but Jesus goes out into the main garden area and takes with him Peter, James, and John. You know what happens. He says, stay awake and watch and pray with me. And they don't. They go right to sleep. You know, here we are at the very fulcrum of all human history where Jesus is going to engage in the pivotal battle with the mortal enemy of mankind, Satan, and the leaders of the church are sound asleep. And things have not changed, my friends. They have not changed. And I'm, a, I'm one of them. I'm a leader of the church, too. It's so easy for us to be kind of snoozing or what have you. More than snoozing, we'll say in a moment. But, you know, this idea of them sleeping is a very powerful picture. But before we just pick on the clergy leaders of the church, remember that the head of the domestic church is the, is the, are the parents, the father especially. Well, a lot of parents are sort of asleep at the switch. They have very little idea what their kids are doing. They come home from work, they're tired, and, and so on. And the, the whole thing is very easy for us to really understand. We are easily very drowsy. Now, again, what the probable reason they were drowsy was certainly that it was later in the evening, but also they'd, they'd had four glasses of wine if it was a traditional Passover meal. <laughs> so that's not going to help either. And, you know, that was part of it was actually prescribed. But, so, but the point is that there's a lot of factors. 
But it helps us to appreciate, too, that Jesus says, I want you to stay awake, and I want you to be alert, lest you give way to temptation. You see? Watch with me and pray. Well, they sleep. Now, try to think of sleep here not just as physical sleep. We go into lots of slumbers, we human beings. You know, we have a moral slumber, you know, where we just kind of go with the flow and we don't ask important moral questions about our life. You know, we're supposed to be moral agents who ponder, why am I doing these things? And is it right or wrong? Living a reflective life. But too often we just kind of slumber. We go along with the flow. Dead bodies float downstream. You know, we're sleepy and kind of out of it. We're not very alert or reflective. Other times we kind of medicate ourselves. You know, it, it, it could be alcohol or some other drug, uh, illegal drug or what have you. But it's it's um, sometimes it's other things like, you know, let's just say, oh, man, it's just too painful to look at the situation that's going on, whether in the world or in my family. I tell you what, let's just, what's on YouTube? You know, just flip through videos and just sort of tune out. And this is how we are. That when we're engaged, in, instead of in being engaged in the battle, we're too easily just drowsy and sleepy. We sort of anesthetize ourselves and... We, uh, we just kind of medicate ourselves or uh, just tune out, see? And so don't just see sleep as physical here. And this is what the apostles do, and we do it too. Now, again, we'll talk a little bit more about why in a moment, all right? But another thing you'll notice is they, they kind of, they, they dodge, and uh, as in get the heck out of Dodge. <laughs> and... Um, well, you know, and, and, the, and, they, and they, um, they uh, become, um, they, they not only dodge, but they deny. We're also going to see that they, at one moment, they seek to destroy. Let, let's look at that one first. You know, when Peter does finally wake up and Jesus is being arrested, he gets a sword and it hacks off the, the ear of the slave of the high priest. Malchus, or is, 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 is the given name in one of the Gospels. Now look... Uh, it's, it's something what happens is sometimes, you know, we're asleep at the switch and all of a sudden we wake up and we realize, man, the world's gone to heck. And what's going on? And instead of really being instructed, we just kind of lash out and we get angry and we, we scream and holler. And some people's children, maybe it's that an election didn't go our way or a Supreme Court decision. But anyway, we're all of a sudden we're awake. But instead of really being productive in terms of how are we going to uh, move the gospel forward, we're just, you know, kind of like yelling and screaming and angry and, you know, and hacking off the equivalent of the slave, the year of the slave of the high priest. It's, we, 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 we lash out. We, we, we just, you know, or it might be something in our family. We've been in denial for a while and all of a sudden we realize, wow, it's true. So-and-so really is acting in a way that they're taking stuff. They're just stealing. And, you know, we wake up and we're angry and, you know, and uh, again, it's not that there's never any time or place for anger, but this lashing out is, is again, it, it's not indicative of someone who's confident of the truth of the gospel or the victory that we already have in Christ Jesus. So this lashing out, this anger, this, on my own terms, I got to protect Jesus. And he says, he says, put away your sword, Peter. Am I not to undergo the death the Father intends for me? I mean, you know, Peter wants to take things in his own hand. And so, again, sometimes we're like that. You see, when we, we're sleepy, we're drowsy, we're not paying attention, it's too painful, we tune out. But all of a sudden we wake up and we have all the answers immediately rather than to uh, say, all right, Lord, what do you want me to do? I'm waking up finally. I'm, I'm sorry I've been sleepy. What do you need me to do? All right. Living a reflective, careful life that isn't just reactionary. We want to be making responses, not just reacting. Okay, now we see that uh, so they, they, they not only do they, dis, they you know drowsy, get drowsy, they seek to destroy, and as I said, they also deny and dodge. You know, confronted with uh, these people that came to arrest Jesus, most of the disciples just got the heck out of dodge, so to speak. You know, they just hit the ground running. Uh, Peter and John, however, kind of hang in there. Peter, it says, was following the Lord at a distance. Now, there's a picture for you. Yeah, he's following the Lord, but he's following at a distance, and so do we. You know, in other words, uh, oh, I, uh, you know, we'll wear the cross, or someone say, 
Are you a Christian? Or do you go to? You're a Catholic, really? You don't believe all that stuff, do you? And so we're like, well, and then we kind of dodge and deny, and we're kind of pulling back, and we're kind of we're sort of into the the Lord and what He teaches, but at a distance. And uh, He's uh, someone we we pay lip service to, but we're not really going to be His disciples clearly. And when someone says, "Are you really? Do you really believe?" Well, you know how the Catholic Church can be, you know, blah, 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 you know. Mm. See? And we're not just talking about some maybe rule about incense or something. We're talking about a serious moral issue or teaching that the Church has given us right out of the Scriptures. And yet we run and we kind of dodge and deny. And So Peter is, hey man, you're one of his followers. I can double your Galilean accent. They kind of had a hick accent, the Galileans. And... Um, Peter says, I don't know the man. I don't know the man. You're the Christ, the son of the living God. Well, now he's just, I don't know the man. And so not only does he follow the Lord at a distance, but this leads then to him finally just outright denying he even knows the guy. The guy, the man. See, we do this. We can, a combination of both, you know, following the Lord at a distance, and this tends to make us more and more alienated from him. We're sort of in there, but we keep our distance, and when things get a little too, I don't know, controversial, we're sort of like, well, we're just claiming, and we're saying, I don't really, you know, I don't take all that stuff too seriously. And we don't take it too seriously, and we just kind of disclaim and deny, and, you know, this is how we are. Why? Well, we'll talk about that in a minute. Finally, there's uh, I mean, one other kind of discipline, or not discipline, some sort of, I call it a disorder that is manifest here, and that's that there's a kind of deflecting that goes on. And this is particularly evident in Pontius Pilate. You know, uh, in, in John's account, it's a very descriptive thing of how Pilate's like, wow. Now, in Luke's gospel, we hear that his wife said, look, I have nothing to do with this innocent man. I've suffered much in a dream because of him. And so he's got that in his mind. He wants to please his wife. He does, he does think, his conscience tells him that Jesus is not guilty of the charges, but he's, he's got this crowd, and if, they, if he doesn't please them, there might be a riot, and if there's a riot, he might lose his job. And when you're a Roman you know, procurator or a governor, you lose your job. It's not like, well, too bad for you. Uh, go become a lawyer in some think tank. I mean, you know, you know your whole life is kind of over. You're in trouble. And uh, sometimes they were even put to death, you know. Um, so again, he's got a lot riding on how this whole Jesus question works out. And so in, he's, he's very, very, uh, you know, concerned about this. And he's saying, look, man, I don't want to condemn this guy. I'll, tell you, I'll give you Barabbas or I'll, I'll, I'll do anything. But don't, don't, uh, no, 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 we crucify him. We want Barabbas, crucify this guy. And, you know, Pilate starts to really get anxious. Now, John masterfully describes this in his gospel that on at least five occasions, Pilate goes into the praetorium to talk to Jesus. He comes out to talk to the leaders, comes, goes back in, comes back out, back in, back out. It's a perfect picture of vacillation. And he's just trying any which way he can to not have to make a decision about Jesus. So he's deflecting. I don't want to have to make a decision about this guy. Look, if, 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 if I <clears throat> condemn him, make him guilty, my wife's angry with me. <laughs> and if mom ain't happy, no one's happy. But on the other hand, if I, you know, and also I'll, I'll you know, if I can, uh, you know, if I uh, don't, if I condemn him, I'll, I'll, I'll go against my own conscience. I know this guy is not guilty of this. But if I don't hand him over, there may be a riot. There may be, I'll be unpopular. Uh, I'm a politician. I'm trying to get places. Nobody wanted to be in Galilee. I'm in the Roman army. That's a place you go, you put in your time to get the heck out of there and go to something better. And Pilate's got his eye probably on other things, but at the end of the day, he just doesn't want to have to make a decision. Well, guess what, Pilate? You have to make a decision. You are free to choose, but you are not free not to choose got to decide. Someone says, well, I'm not going to decide about Jesus. I'm just going to sit on the fence. Well, Satan comes in one day and says, I own the fence. Come with me. You're with me. You've got to make a decision. You're either, you know, Jesus says, look, look, he's either the Lord or he's a liar and a lunatic. 
you got to decide, which is he? If he's the Lord, follow him. If he's not, if you think he's a lunatic or a liar, run. But at the end of the day, Pilate's just in and out, in and out. He doesn't want to have to make a decision. Finally, he does. But even as he does it, he blames them. I am free of the guilt of this man. He's let his guilt be on you. Oh, I'm sorry, Pilate. You are not free of the guilt. You have made a decision about Jesus. And in deciding about him, you've decided your destiny. And now, from all that time, 2,000 years now, we've been saying he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. Pilate made a decision. In trying not to make a decision, he ultimately did. And he can't wash his hand and do all that kind of stuff and say, well, look, I, I wanted to do the right thing, Jesus, but I couldn't because they forced me. Nobody forced you. You have a conscience. You made a decision, and you're responsible for it. Okay? And again, you see, but this is how we are. Well, I don't want to have to decide. You know, I don't want to really have to stand up and make a decision. I want to stay popular and kind of keep my ties with the world alive. It's how I get my money and my career needs to advance. And, you know, if I go too heavy into this Jesus thing, you know, and um, I might, uh, but, you know, if I don't deny, you know, well, come on, you know, you don't really believe all that stuff. If I, if I don't kind of deny him somehow and say, yeah, I don't believe all that stuff. You know, my life could go badly. My career might not advance. You know, hey, you know, who wants to stay at Acme Widget Company when I can move up to IBM Big Blue, you know? So let me get the heck, let me get out of here and get on with that. But I have to sort of grease the skids and do what people want. And so, Jesus, you take a number and uh, I'll follow this. And this is how we are. Okay. Now, I say, you know, are you are we all all these things all the time? No, but these are tendencies we all have. So we can say, hey, these apostles, you know, Pilate, look at this, you know. But at the end of the day, that's us. Now, why? Well, Jesus had been saying all along, all along, we're going to Jerusalem and the Son of Man will suffer and die. At the hands of men, he'll be crucified. But on the third day, I will arise. They didn't seem to be able to get that through their, into their ears and through their thick skull. They just heard the, he's going to suffer and die. Well, that doesn't sound like Messiah. And they were all anxious and this kind of stuff. And when it actually set in, they just kind of tune out in all the ways I just said. They dodge, they deny, they deflect. They're all over the map. Only John made it to the foot of the cross. So one out of 12, huh? So you see, there's a vision here that... Um, they do this, why? Because they haven't really taken to heart that Jesus says, look, I want you to trust me. In three days, I'll rise. The victory is already mine. It is a time of difficulty and suffering. But in three days, I'll rise. Now look, they'd seen him raise Lazarus. They'd seen him raise other people from the dead. They'd seen him cure leprosy, you know, cast out blindness and deafness. They'd seen him cast out demons. They'd seen him walk on the water. Come on. Do they really think he can't pull this off? Apparently, they just couldn't get it around their, into their heads that, hey, look, I'll go through this, and I don't really care what these soldiers or anyone else tries to do with me. In three days, we're going to rise. But it doesn't compute with them. It doesn't compute. And so they just are dismissive of it. Now, this is how we are, too. Because we, we, we do not, as members of the church today, I'm talking collectively, hopefully you're an exception, but we do not, as members of the church today, act like we're on the winning team. We don't behave that way. We're all anxious and worried about what people think, and you know we don't want to get out there and be too strong. We don't want to upset anybody or offend anybody. It hardly seems like we think we're on the winning team. We're anxious and fearful all the time about so many things. And why is this? We serve a God who rose from the dead and told us that's the victory will be ours. But we do have to go through some suffering and difficulty and pain in this life. There are Calvaries to get through. But on the other side of Calvary is joys unspeakable and glories untold. And that's how you get there, and that's the only way you get there. But we're like trying to sue for peace. This is the way we are. And so we've got to go to God and say, I am messed up. I, 
I know you told me in three days you'll rise. And I know you did rise after three days. And I know these things because the apostles told me so. And I saw how you changed their lives at Pentecost. And Lord, I, I need you to change my life. I need you to help me start trusting that you mean what you say. That you'll suffer and die at the hands of men, but in three days you'll rise. And I may have to go through some of that too. And maybe the world isn't going to be my oyster. And I may have to make a decision about you that's hard. And that goes against the grain. It might mean I don't get the promotion. Or that I might get sued or be get hauled into court because I don't go along with some kind of you know, slogan I'm supposed to do. I didn't celebrate tea, you know, well, whatever, you know, all the alphabet soup day. I, 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 you know, somewhere in all of this, we, we, we are all, we forgetful that Jesus sometimes says, you've got to make some decisions and sometimes it's going to be hard. He says elsewhere, if anyone's ashamed of me and my teaching in this adulterous age, the son of man will be, dis, you know, be embarrassed about him on the day of judgment. So, the question is for us, do you know what the end's going to be? Have you looked at the end of the Bible and seen how Jesus is victorious and all the evil ones are cast into hell? Have you seen and have you heard, you know, again, what the Lord teaches, how he rose from the dead, just as he promised? Why are we so afraid? Well, we are. And sometimes it's because we just have too much investments in this world. We have too much to lose. We gotta beg God, but we gotta beg God to help us, because otherwise, too easily, this foolishness that we see on display by most of the people in the passion narrative is our foolishness too. There's a vow, there's this old song that says, "Done made my vow to the Lord, and I never will turn back. Oh, I will go, and I shall go, and see what the end shall be." So we made a vow to the Lord on the day of our baptism to love him, to trust him, to follow him, and to keep faith in him. And so what we want to do now is say, Lord, help me to really live those vows and help me to be aware that I'm on the winning team and help me to behave that way, to go into the world with confidence. And that even when I say things that are unpopular because your teachings are being kind of largely set aside by many, Lord, help me to know that that's all right. It's... Uh, but at the end of the day, your teachings are still true. And not be so anxious that not everybody agrees or goes along or feels offended or hurt or angry by these things. Help me, Lord. I, too easily. I don't know what the end shall be. I, I, I know it up here intellectually, but in my heart, it's way off in the distance, and I'm scared as heck. Okay. Well, a lot to consider on Palm Sunday, and 27 minutes is much too long for a video so we'll end here but look this is us but it doesn't have to be if we can remember to see what the end shall be because of that we can go through things and setbacks and trials knowing that at the end of the day we win with Jesus we win it isn't always going to be obvious in a worldly way or in our lifetime but if you stay faithful unto death and so do I we win in the end I don't know about you, but on that great day, that great getting up morning, I want to be among the saints. And I want to be among that number when those saints go marching in. They'll go in victorious and joyful while the wicked look on with dismay. And we're not there to gloat, but we are there to simply say, Lord, it's always been true that I would win with you. And at times I didn't behave that way, but thank you, Lord, that for the times that I did and help me to, to do this even more to obey you, trust you, and know and act like I'm on the winning team. Help me to wave the palm of victory, shout Hosanna, rather than collapse in fear and cry out with the crowd, crucify him. Keep me, Lord, faithful unto death. Amen.